Good evening, good evening. How is everyone? All right. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association, and I am delighted and honored to welcome you to the 45th annual conference of our great association. If you're happy about that, wave your hands in the air. There you go. All right. Yes, it's been three long years, three long years since we've been together in person. I want to take a moment to thank the scientists, the researchers, nurses, doctors, medical mental health professionals, and so many others who, who have helped us combat COVID-19 so that we can finally enjoy this reunion together. In fact, the next time we meet as a community at the Fulbright Prize event on April 19th at the Grand Hyatt here in Washington, we will get another chance to thank this very community for their hard work and their heroism here in Bethesda, we are less than two miles, really walking distance, to the National Institutes of Health, which is where Drs. Kazmekia Corbett and Anthony Fauci teamed together to literally save the world. So we will be honoring those two at the Fulbright Prize that evening, and we hope very much that you will be there. Before I offer a brief introduction to this conference and then to start our exceptional program this evening, I would like to um, acknowledge the people whose land we are standing on today. That is the Susquehannock tribe, the Piscataway peoples, including the Piscataway Conoy tribe and the Choptico band of the Piscataway Indian nation. It is important, it is vital, it is right to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices they were forced to make. In remembering the Susquehannock tribe, the Piscataway people's communities, we honor their memory, their lives, and their descendants. We also remember that we are guests of this land, and we must do our best to never forget its original inhabitants. Such respect for other cultures and peoples is deep in the bones of the Fulbright community, a community we will celebrate and enjoy over the next few days. Allow me to highlight a few of our plenary programs, share some housekeeping, and give thanks to the people and institutions who have made this conference possible. I know you will enjoy the Selma Jean Cohen dance lecture tomorrow uh, late morning featuring Katakali performer and anthropologist, Dr. Janaki Nair. Later that afternoon, we gather to see a film that will build a more measured and informed perspective on the complex life and legacy of Senator Fulbright himself. After dinner on your own, where I hope you'll discuss that film and its meaning to you, we will get together for a party. I understand this is unusual for Fulbrighters, but you're allowed to have fun, so it's really okay. <laughs> the blue ticket that you have in your, in your name tag, that is your, that is your drink ticket for that evening. Uh, of course, if you really want to have fun, you're going to have to get more than one ticket, which also means you're going to have to bring some hold cold card cash with you in order to, uh, to buy more of those. On Saturday afternoon, we'll be doing something else new for this conference. We will offer an overview of the association's programs and opportunities to volunteer, followed by a programs fair so that you can get even more engaged than you are now. That evening at an awards dinner, we will celebrate the amazing volunteers and chapters that power our mission. All along, please explore and attend the many panels, posters, uh, uh, round tables, presentations, exhibitions. If you are presenting any of these and you are involved in that, please raise your hand right now. So if you're a panelist or presenter, yeah, this is going to be great. Thank you so, so much. I'm deeply grateful to all of you for the rich, provocative content that we will enjoy over the next few days. All of us will leave here inspired, challenged, and educated and I'm so excited uh, to be listening and to be attending these. Each morning, you'll also get a chance to stretch and be centered, thanks to yoga 
We have, um, uh, I, I probably will not be able to get up that early, but you should. Um, <laughs> so, so please be there. Uh, it's on, it'll be on the rooftop. There's a wonderful view of Bethesda from up there. You do have to register for this. Uh, and the way to do that is to use our new conference app. Yes, we have joined the 21st century and we have a conference app. We've never done this before and I know almost all of you are incredibly skeptical about this. Um, but it is a wonderful resource. You can find out all about programs and announcements. Please, uh, please engage with that. As you enjoy these days of reunion, I hope you'll join me in thanking those who've made this possible. Of course, we start with you, our friends and supporters, members of the association, donors. I am very grateful to our national board of directors, uh, led so exceptionally by my friend, a mentor, and partner, uh, the Honorable Cynthia Baldwin. Thank you, Cynthia. Many members of our 1946 society are here um, among our most generous and loyal supporters, and I thank them as well. In your physical program and on that app, you will see a list of our institutional members, so important to our mission and outreach, and our sponsors. We cannot do these conferences or really any of our programs without significant financial support of these organizations. Many thanks to the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, uh, which is sponsoring our chapter leadership workshop, and they fund chapter activities nationwide, so uh, we're grateful to ECA. Uh, Auburn University is probably as loyal a sponsor as I can imagine, so I'm, uh, thank you for, to Auburn. We also thank the Penn State uh, Global at Pennsylvania State University, the University of South Florida, the WEGG Prize, and the Fulbright Teacher Exchanges. I am blessed to be working with a remarkable, talented, fantastic group of professionals, and I'd like to recognize them right now. I hope they're in the room. Fiona Breslin, Stephen Gardner, Claire Jagla, Munir Sayer, uh, Christine Oswald, and Alicia Montague. Are you guys here? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, um, I, I am a very, very lucky man. Finally, I am delighted to announce to you what you may have already learned, which is that we will gather for the 46th annual conference in Denver, Colorado, next October. Uh, that's October 19 to 22. Yes, there you go. We are a national organization and community, so it is time that we acknowledged anyone west of the Appalachian Mountains. So. We are going west uh, and hope you will join us there along with your friends and other Fulbrighters and where your organization can be one of our sponsors. There's your plug for the last second. Now it is my overdue duty to introduce, uh, to start our program and turn it over to my friend and national board member, uh, former uh, ambassador from Hungary, Reka Svermakin. Reka? Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you really everyone in this wonderful board and in this wonderful group of uh, people for this very important opportunity. And I think we have a very special chance today to start our annual conference in a very, very, on a very, very important strategic and really um, um, crucial uh, development of the uh, past year. The world uh, that we have seen, which I think has been completely uh, unexpected by a lot of us in the, uh, in the room. The world today is really appalled to see uh, Russia's war crimes in Ukraine and the um, barbaric war tactics that are being implied. The, um, the people of Ukraine, the Ukrainians, are doing spectacularly fantastic in standing up to this pressure, in um, being an, an incredible, uh, sending an incredible message to all of us about defense, about values, about fighting for our common values, and about the importance of 
uh, freedom and independence. I believe this is a powerful message that we all have taken in the last few months, and this is why we are so honored and very uh, excited to have the ambassador of Ukraine among us. Russia is roiling. There are so many int developments inside that is really, you can feel how difficult, how uh, much change, how many changes, how much is happening behind the um, the uh, narrative, the propaganda war that is on the surface uh, from Russian uh, media. We're seeing the world in reacting massively supporting Ukraine. And as a, resu as a result of this incredible, impressive, heroic fight that Ukraine has been put up, we really wanted to welcome this, we wanted to honor this, and we, we were thinking that the best way to do this is to invite the representative of Ukraine to start our annual discussion with her opening remarks. So we're extremely honored to have Ambassador uh, Mark Karova among us today. As a sentence of introduction of an incredibly impressive career that's behind her and that uh, allows me to say that I am particularly personally happy to know you as a as a wonderful diplomat, as a fantastic um, expert, as a wonderful leader, as a mother, and as a representative of a wonderful country among us. Uh, just a few sentences of, your, of the background uh, of this fantastic career. Um, Ambassador Markova is also a former Minister of Finance. Um, she worked um, in, as minister, as in the Ministry of Finance as a uh, minister on several key strategic initiatives of her country. One of these is certainly, for instance, if I may just enumerate uh, them, one of this is to start a, um, uh, the, a public in the public finance sector, one of the largest open data uh, um, initiative uh, in Ukraine, as a result of which he was awarded the Open Data Leader Award uh, back in 2018 already. Also as an MFA leader, she uh, um, was the creator, the uh, initiator of Ukraine Invest Investment Attraction and Support Office, which uh, helped massively to open up the Ukrainian market to international investors and to leading up to a number of fundamental changes in her country and in the economy uh, of Ukraine. As a, she worked in the private sector and she has a, a wonderful career uh, in uh, the governmental, the civic sector as well. Um, as part of her commitment to uh, strengthen US-Ukrainian ties, she is here. I don't think that she could have been here in a better and more important moment. So please join me welcoming the ambassador, Her Excellency Oksana Markarova, here on stage. Thank you. Dear Fulbright Association members, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it's uh, a big honor for me to be here with you tonight. It's, it's a great way to finish a day, to be in the room full of so nice and smart people at the same time. And I know that because we have a Fulbrighter in our embassy team. She's here with me, Katarina Smagli, and I'm very fortunate to have her with me as the team member. Um, in the next two days, and I was, it was so interesting to hear the program, I wish I could be here rather than doing my job, but you know, it, it's going to be a great program and a great reunion, and you will talk about so many things, but of course, because of this unprecedented war in Ukraine, because of how Russia violated pretty much all international laws and all principles, uh, of course your discussions will be centered on the issues of peace. Of course you will be talking about what is it that we all together missed, that the wall did not stop and did not prevent something like this from happening. You will talk about the democracy, and you will talk about whether democracies can not only deliver to their people, to our people, but also defend themselves. Can we all be peaceful and live the way we want to live and still not be attacked by a violent neighbor, by a much larger nuclear state, uh, which is on the Security Council of the UN? In the last months of this 
truly senseless war. I mean, not senseless for us because we are defending our homes and loved ones, but senseless from the standpoint why Russia even started that war, to invade a foreign country, to invade a neighbor, peaceful neighbor in the 21st century when we all uh, in academia, in, in uh, expert communities, in decision-making communities, in normal countries, do not even think in terms of land, do not even think in terms of conquering someone. We think about how to get the ideas, how to develop our countries, how to leapfrog into the next centuries. And now we are facing with this 19th century deeds that are done in the 21st century. In the last eight months, we have received so many letters from universities, scholars, from, uh, from, from the academic community broadly. And these messages were filled, of course, with sympathy, with sorrow, with uh, admiration of our courageous fight. Uh, but also, they focused a lot about these principles of democracy and international law, and how everyone in the, in the, in the, in the uh, expert community, and especially in the educational community, academia, and you know, people in this room understand that this fight is so much bigger than Ukraine, although, of course, it's existential for us. Um, standing here today, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank all the academic institutions for making everything possible and sometimes impossible to provide psychological, financial, and academic support to our Ukrainian academic institutions. We have almost 2,000 uh, 2, students from Ukraine studying in U.S. universities today. Uh, we have a number of universities in the United States supporting universities in Ukraine, in, in Kyiv, and in other places, especially universities that had to flee from, from places like Mariupol and Kharkiv. Some of them had to relocate the second time after they relocated from Crimea or from Donetsk and Lugansk in 2014, because we all in this room know that this war did not start 225 days ago. The full-fledged phase of it, yes. But the war started eight years ago, and we have been fighting this for quite some time now. So, of course, in the last 225 days, uh, it's an experience that none of us expected to live through, again, in the 21st century. And we had to reconsider a number of life priorities, and we had to rethink about how we do things. And I definitely, when, accept, when I was accepting the uh, proposal from my president to, to become an ambassador, come back to the public sector, go to the U.S., because of my financial background, of course, we were thinking about you know, strategic partnership in terms of investment and economic development and trade and, and everything that I was going to focus on. And now I know more about the weapons than I ever thought I would know, you know, all the details that, that, that my husband sometimes jokes that my next career probably would be like arms trading or something, you know, like I, like I have to use this knowledge somehow in the, in the future. So this really troubling and cruel times have forced us all, once again, the, to, to, to appreciate the importance of public diplomacy and to appreciate the importance of soft power, even though, again, I talk about the, the weapons and sanctions and all the hard stuff all the time, both publicly and with our partners. But we have to, we have, we have to acknowledge that this war actually brought us back to the understanding how important the education and academic pro programs are. I can definitely say that Ukraine's victory on the battlefield and the resilience of our society uh, was made possible, of course, because of the courage of our president. I mean, undoubtedly, the leadership in these times, the, our defenders, the armed forces that, that are fighting on the front lines, but also the, the fact that during the past 30 years, after we became independent, that we have embraced the ideas of educational reform, that we have opened ourselves, unlike Russia, to the ideas of, of, uh, of uh, international community and the global thinking. And your program, the Fulbright program, have been such a critical element of that success. Uh, just a couple of facts, you know, from the day of its inception in early 1992, it was just a year after Ukraine regained its independence after almost 70 years under occupation by the Soviet Union, the program office 
uh, has played a vital role in the, in the development of Ukrainian educational system, not just the program itself, but actually doing the change on the ground. The program had a modest beginning with only 10 American scholars visiting Ukraine per year. Today, the cohort of Ukrainian Fulbrighters is actually more than 1,000 Ukrainian and 750 American professors and students. Quite an achievement, and thank you very much for that. And please do more. You know, of course, it's... I, uh, I, I, we should have in the audience today Dr. Bill Willen from Kent State University. I don't know whether you're here or not, but... We, we were told that he would be visiting the, the reunion. Uh, he actually spent a semester in Horlivka State Pedagogical University for Foreign Languages. And years after, after that, uh, in his memories, he remembered this teaching experience in Ukraine. And he, uh, the town of Horlivka in Donetsk Oblast now has been under occupation by Russians since 2014. So when we, when we looked at what uh, Dr. Willen said about his time there, and he noted that, uh, and I'll quote him, when he visited the town of Artyomivsk, uh, he, sa he said that one sad diversion during our very informative and ambit tour through the factory was coming across a monument in honor of 3,000 people, mostly Jews, buried alive by Nazis in 1942. Their remains were discovered in the caves when the area was liberated in 1943. Now, 80 years after that happening in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, to, to Ukrainians, to, uh, there you are, <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, 80 years, these territories have been right now liberated by Ukrainians, as we speak, you know, our counteroffensive in the, in the east of Ukraine. And unfortunately, again, when we are liberating them from Russians now, we are finding the torture chamber, ch chambers and the mass graves and, uh, you know, the signs of uh, atrocities that, again, should not only be studied and, and, of course, people should be brought to justice for that, but it should not be something that is even possible in the 21st century. So while in Ukraine, our American colleagues could not only observe dramatic changes taking place in Ukraine during this time, not only the transition from the post-Soviet Ukraine to the modern Ukraine, Ukraine that is at the, at the far front of this fight for democracy, but also all, all Fulbright, Fulbrighters that have been there became active agents in rebirth of Ukrainian culture, in rebirth of Ukrainian academic institutions. Uh, the Ukrainian colleagues, like Katya, of course, who were in the United States use on, on this program, also could acquire new knowledge and this new vision and skills and, and uh, broad perspective allowed them also to change Ukraine when they were coming back to Ukraine after being on the scholarship programs here. So I'm confident that the Fulbright not only already played amazing uh, critical, critical role in Ukraine, but can only be stronger in the coming years. And right now, during this time of war and our fight, which again, we, it's very difficult. It's not easy. It will take us a lot of you know, prayers and weapons and, and sanctions and support of all the uh, countries that share the same values to win. But we have no doubt that we will win. We do not have any other choice. And after we win, we will need all the brains and all the hearts and all the Fulbrighters to be there on the ground, helping us to, 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 to leapfrog, to rebuild, to move the country forward, to go through this painful process of you know, finding the new humanity after going through so many difficult, difficult uh, uh, situations, but also I think Ukraine can be the answer to so many global pro pro problems. I mean, Ukraine, Russia has created a lot of risks. You, we all hear about the energy crises, the uh, migration crises, the food crises, everything that Russia is doing in order to uh, defeat us and defeat all the democratic countries. But the key to resolving these questions is actually in Ukraine. Some of them definitely. We can feed the world. 
We can actually, we even now export electricity from Ukraine. Uh, but we can do much more, especially if we can get the Russians out from the nuclear station, which they are holding, uh, which is inconceivable. So there is a great role for all the innovators, and there is a great role for educators. We have to do it differently, and it's the people who, like you, who can help us transition. Um, I would like to, again, thank you and finish with a story. Uh, in September 2001, the full right office in Ukraine has moved to a new and much more spacious and comfortable office. And everyone who has been to the office in Ukraine uh, remembers it. Uh, the then US ambassador to Ukraine, Carlos Pascual, who is a dear friend as well, scheduled the presentation of US exchange programs at the press conference set for September 12th. It was the September 12th, 2000. Uh, 2001, and then September 11 happened a day before that. And uh, there was a debate, much like debate we had on the February 25th of this year, what to do after the start of the war. Do we continue with you know, our educational programs, our Ukraine House events, the, everything else? And the same was debate in the Fulbright office and in the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, and the decision was made to go ahead with the press conference and open the office, uh, even though, of course, you know, the, uh, you know, everyone was thinking again about the horrible event that just happened. Uh, and I remember that some Ukrainians at first were surprised, you know, that, that the ceremony was not canceled, the ribbon cutting, but then, uh, the point of actually doing it was very clear, and it's very clear to us now. That's why we didn't stop our events either. Because in times like this, we have to very clearly show that the, this, this horrible violence, the terrorism, the war, will never uh, defeat us and will never uh, put us back into some dark times and will never stop us from focusing on what is important. So in times of like we experienced today, in times like U.S. experienced when the September 11 happened, we actually need to enhance everything that makes us humans. We have to study more. We have to um, share more. We have to spend more time on cultural on cultural studies. We have to really show the world why is it happening and show the true narrative about what is happening. I think, you know, the fact that we had so many brave journalists uh, in Ukraine from September 20, from February 24th, risking their lives, and unfortunately we have lost already so many Ukrainian and American and other international journalists, it made a difference that people actually talk about it. And the fact that we can still laugh and we can, we can rejoice and we can return sometimes with children, Ukrainians are returning, and continue to live and continue to show this resilience, uh, it's also a very important element of the future and current already victory. So with that again, I would like to thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you for having me with you. Um, I wish you exciting two days of the program. And uh, uh, now I will definitely finish with the quote of the Senator Fulbright, who said, to bring a little more knowledge, a little more reason, a little more compassion into world affairs, and thereby increase the chance that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. Amen to that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for these introductory thoughts, and I think this is really giving um, so much food for thought and so much inspiration for our daily work and our commitment to the values that Fulbright, as a, the association, and all the members individually represent, um, believe in, and work for, that I think it's a real 
um, solid foundation for a strategic discussion and a strategic support for these values and for uh, the cooperation of our nations. We are having a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity here to um, continue the discussion and turn it into a discussion, to, say, uh, to be more precise. Um, so, before we jump into the, the, this, I would like to um, remind you that we have two big microphones in the two uh, um, aisles, and I would like to ask you if you have questions during the discussion to walk to the microphone and, uh, so that we can profit from the presence of the ambassador and of our contributors to the panel. As a very brief uh, introduction I would like to the discussion, I would like to um, introduce, uh, well, Maybe if I can start with my friend uh, and a wonderful, most impressive uh, expert on uh, this region and on security policy, Deborah Kagan. Deborah, um, among the many uh, very impressive uh, uh, senior positions in the State Department, was senior coordinator for nuclear and non-proliferation policy in the Bureau of European and Canadian Affairs in the State Department, was director for policy for regional affairs, uh, um, uh, and then, uh, if I may just pick a few, political advisor uh, in the Department of um, Defense on uh, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander's transformation, um, and also a uh, DES on Defense for Coalition and Multinational Operations uh, in the uh, Department of Defense. Um, one of the best renowned experts on Russia, Ukraine, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, just to name a few of the uh, big issues that Deborah has covered. So we're very honored to have, uh, have you with us. And we're also very, yes, thank you. <laughs> and we're also very happy and honored to have a representative of the region, of a neighboring country that has given a very special, very strategic support for the fight uh, and for the defense of uh, Ukraine and um, the values that we stand for, the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Lithuania, Arturas Vazbis. Very nice to have you here. Arturas served in various uh, very important positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania uh, prior to coming to the U.S. as well. He was counselor at the uh, communications department, worked in the mission of Lithuania, the permanent, represent, uh, permanent delegation to NATO uh, in Brussels, um, was head of strategy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and prior to that was also member of parliament at the Seimas. So we are very, uh, has a very strong background both in policy and in politics and in strategic issues. So. <clears throat> So not to lose time, I would like to um, jump into the discussion um, just where you, you left uh, your chain of thoughts, uh, if I uh, may. One of the um, very impressive things is you know, how successful the military defense has been turning the tide uh, over the last few weeks. Just after um, September 30th, if you, if you remember, just a week ago, uh, when, when uh, Vladimir Putin walked through the uh, 30 or 40 feet high gold doors uh, of the Kremlin's um, St. George Hall to announce the annexation of 15% uh, uh, of, of Ukraine. Um, the day after, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, in, in sharp uh, contrast to this, in military fatigue, on a very humble table in an open air uh, environment, signed Ukraine's application to join NATO. And the uh, military offensive not taking the red line uh, set by the um, uh, declaration of annexation has been very successful in recapturing the very territory that we had seen under uh, Russian uh, claims before. So uh, what we can see is that there is, a, it seems like um, there is a, a several very important strategic turns in the military defense of the country. Um, but also, it seems like there is an escalation as well. We have heard uh, Vladimir Putin uh, discuss uh, uh, several times publicly the issue of using tactical nuclear uh, weapons. I think it's a very serious thing. Is there an end in sight? Or is it, uh, how do you see the next uh, months uh, most important developments. How do you think this military 
and security challenges that Ukraine is facing. Um, and I would like to ask all of our speakers in the panel, um, will unfold in the uh, weeks ahead of us. Do you, would you want to start? Well, thank you. First, you know, of course, when we saw that uh, Putin signed these documents on, you know, in his view, annexation of some uh, territories of Ukraine, illegal, of course, uh, at the very moment when he was signing it, a number of uh, uh, villages and towns which were included in his original plan were already liberated. And they have been liberated as we speak. Uh, the escalate to de-escalate is the very, you know, f famous uh, game Mr. Putin plays all the time. Uh, he uh, announced that he will conquer Ukraine in three days, then he announced that he will conquer Kyiv in three days, then he announced that he already controls all the Kyiv Oblast and then he was forced to retreat. Then he said that, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, joining F Finland and, and, and Sweden joining NATO is the red line, and then when they decided to join, he said, well, it was never a problem in the first place. So I think we clearly see all the time that his initial goal, and that goal has been communicated by him for the past 30 years, has been to destroy Ukraine, to re re reinvent or recreate the empire. It goes beyond Ukraine, actually. It's about a number of countries around uh, Russia and countries that uh, fought for the independence before 1991 and became independent. That goal didn't change for him. Now, whether he is, uh, uh, trying to scare us with, with whatever he's trying to scare. I mean, the nuclear threat is already there because they already uh, uh, occupied the largest nuclear station in Europe. The, it's the, the largest Ukrainian, but it's also the largest European uh, station, and they shouldn't be there. Uh, but, you know, for us, there is only one choice of, of events. We will continue liberating our homes. And what we see actually that when we talk to Mr. Putin from the position of strength, when we go ahead and liberate Kiev Oblast, when we go ahead and liberate uh, other Northern uh, Oblast, when we are decisively pushing them back uh, in, in the East and, and South, he actually retreats and uh, his forces retreat. So we just have to stay the course, we just have to continue doing it, and our response should be that of strength. More support, more sanctions, until he is uh, out of Ukraine again, because it's not only what Ukraine wants, wants, it's not only what US believes is the right thing to do, it's what 141 countries voted at the United Nations General Assembly uh, decision as early as March, and this is what the International Court told him to do. The question is, can we all together enforce these decisions? We are definitely prepared to enforce it, and we need all the, all the support to, to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> Deborah. Yeah, it's on. Hi, um, thank you for having me here and the opportunity to say a couple of things. First, I want to say that the most effective way to stop a country from invading you is to have adequate deterrence. And we failed, I believe, as a government early on in not recognizing that Putin's threats were real. We depended heavily on diplomacy, which only gave him time to buttress his forces and amass his uh, strategic lines of communication. And we still, even after he crossed what I'd like to call the Maginot Line, um, this year, we still were very hesitant and we effectively tied one hand behind our back by saying, if we do too much, it'll upset Putin and then we don't know what the outcome will be. And I think that um, kept us, and I don't mean just the United States, I mean a lot of countries in the West, save for those that live in the neighborhood and know better, um, it kept us from doing all we could to make Ukraine a stronger, mightier, less desirable morsel for Putin to try to absorb. And I think we have now, just in the last couple of weeks, virtually everyone who badly predicted 
uh, what the Ukrainian military would do. Uh, so many people, three days, three weeks and the like, they're still out there calling themselves experts, even though they've been wrong. Um, there's this recognition now that when you're fighting for your very survival, for your sovereignty, for your continuation as an independent sovereign nation, that that is a heck of a lot stronger motivation than it is to throw uh, personnel into battle as if they're cannon fodder, which is what Putin has done. Um, so I'm just gonna leapfrog, if you will permit me, on one other comment. Even now, there's a great deal of hand-wringing in the West um, and, and in the East as well about Putin's threats of using nuclear weapons. And, and I wanna just remind of, of one or two things here. First is, Putin's not the one who's gonna be pushing this button. Our colleagues in Lithuania have had to face Iskander nuclear-armed missiles sitting on their border for decades, so this isn't new for them or for the Poles. And um, his military is starting to say, wait a minute, um, if we do this, and then you have to go into the battle space to hold that territory, we're playing in a very dirt dirty battle space, which is gonna be dirtier than Zaporizhia. And I don't think any military commander with half an ounce of common sense thinks that's a wise idea, because it's an automatic death sentence for them. And, and so I think there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, to, to not allow Putin to preempt what ought to be done to help Ukraine win this and have success. And I think we have to start using terms like win and defeat and stop just saying successful so we can get to the negotiating table. Um, I should throw this out and the ambassador, both ambassadors have heard me say this before, I'm an Appomattox kind of girl. So I believe in unconditional surrender and, and I think that's where Ukraine is headed and we ought to be supporting them in that and not spend all our time hand-wringing over Vladimir, Vladimir Putin's um, you know, demise. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone. It's nice to be uh, with you. Uh, yeah, I would like maybe to pick up from uh, the point uh, Deborah started with, uh, uh, yeah, on on um, illusions which uh, West had for many years uh, regarding Putin and Russia and Kremlin, uh, thinking that uh, they could negotiate them uh, they, using diplomatic means. Uh, well, and uh, Lithuania having an experience of uh, centuries living next to Russia, like Ukraine like uh, other countries in our region, we didn't have such an illusions uh, well, for, for, for last 30 years after we regained our independence in 1990. Um, and well, in, 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 in the West, uh, we were always uh, treated like, uh, you know, uh, some uh, kind of uh, extreme, extreme, uh, uh, minded, uh, russophobic, uh, paranoid, uh, you, you name it, but uh, uh, I, I'm not talking about uh, United States, uh, more about uh, our Western partners in, 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 in Europe. And we, we, we were always uh, uh, trying to say that uh, you underestimate or you just miscalculate uh, what, what Russia is, is, is about. And now, uh, you know, the, the, the bright part of this uh, really, really dark uh, uh, picture when we have war, terrible things in, in the middle of Europe, um, the, 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 the bright side is that uh, many countries in, in, in Europe and uh, across Atlantic in, in, in the world, they start to really understand uh, what, what Russia is about and even uh, Finland and Sweden to neutral countries for centuries, for 200 years, uh, they, they, their strategy were to keep neutrality and they thought it works, it will work. It worked during the Cold War, but uh, now, like a few months ago, as you know, 
uh, they, they applied for NATO membership and uh, hopefully they, they'll get it in the upcoming uh, months or even, or, or even weeks. So, uh, okay, this uh, world uh, understanding have, have changed and this is a good sign, at least now. And we can, can you know, start from this point uh, building a new, 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 probably, hopefully, new world order and uh, long-standing peace after Ukraine wins the war, uh, which we are aware and will do everything uh, to that to happen. Uh, like like uh, uh, neighbors of Ukraine and having a common history for, for, for many centuries as well as uh, also as uh, NATO members and uh, European Union members. Another, another uh, you know, uh, I would say positive new in this uh, quite uh, 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 dark environment is, uh, well, um, when we are speaking also yeah, about the, the so-called annexation of four Ukrainian regions. Uh, to my view, this step made by Putin means that Russia is starting losing the war. And they do understand, they're starting to realize that Otherwise, why should you do so stupid things, you know? <laughs> all, 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 all the world doesn't recognize that and uh, don't care about how, how you, you know, name those, those regions. And even, the, 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 you know, the best thing was that uh, uh, even less than a day after he declared that those territories are Russian, Ukraine uh, managed to regain the city of Liman, which is in Donetsk, uh, you know, region. In, in, in claimed uh, Russian territory and, and, and what? Nothing, nothing. Just, yeah, from the beginning of the war, they, they put in, you know, they threatened with this uh, nuclear possi possibility of nuclear attack from the very beginning, from the first day, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Then uh, he, uh, you know, he repeated that uh, uh, during uh, the, 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 the uh, when, when he de declared so 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 called annexation, and uh, again nothing. I, I don't say that it's not gonna happen and it's impossible that it will happen. But uh, well, uh, personally, I I I I, I hope that uh, well uh, you know uh, uh, the the uh, position of Western countries, which is you know. Is, is, is being demonstrated during this war, uh, uh, even for, uh, I, I'm speaking on, on, uh, about the countries which were skeptical on, on that, they, they, they changed their attitude. Germany, they, they you know, they uh, are starting they, to, to rebuild their uh, military capacities uh, to invest in, 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 in defense and uh, also they, they are in, in, in Lithuania in uh, enhanced for forward present forces. Uh, so uh, th this makes us believe that it could change and the, the most important thing now is, you know, is just to continue that and not let ourselves to be blackmailed anymore by Russia. Uh, neither by nuclear threat nor by an energy crisis, we can survive everything. If Ukrainians manage to su survive this, we are able to to do that as well. So and uh, look, and so we are looking forward. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering uh, if there's a possibility when peace really arrives that you are able to invite everybody who is gathered here tonight to your capital, whether it's a single formal event or it's a series or you just invite us for coffee <laughs> or whatever the local brew is. Uh, that's my question. I hope you'll take it up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Miguel. I am a Fulbright scholar from Venezuela. Um, I would like to know about how we can support the Ukrainian students. Because as a Fulbright scholar, I know how challenging it can be being aware from your family and everything. And also, I would like to know uh, something about you know, the relationship that, that Russia has with my country, with Venezuela, with Nicaragua, with Brazil, with 
with Cuba because sometimes we talk only about Europe, but we forget that our neighbors are friends of the common enemy. So I would like to know this. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Arthur Pichetowski, and I'm a sociologist. I have one of my own questions, and then two nuances to a question which was asked, so it'll be, be, be brief. But uh, um, my question is, is uh, what's been really striking about Ambassador Makarova, you, uh, President Zelensky, and literally everybody from your group, is the truth and sincerity you bring to the global order. Uh, you seem to be breaking through diplomatic doublespeak. You seem to be questioning all institutions throughout the world to reflect back onto themselves. And my question is, is this the new world order? Uh, that, that, that's my question. Truth, integrity, dignity, stepping away from illusions that are presented in manipulative enterprise where institutions try to design right influence over each other. Um, two nuances. Um, I guess uh, the gentleman had the question, what's Africa's interest? So if you could explain, uh, possibly, uh, the quest of Ukrainian identity and maybe how it's similar to the quest of black Americans in the United States, uh, because I think there are some parallels that could be uh, mentioned there. And then the third nuance is uh, little by little uh, from far away. Uh, so my, my grandma also was in a war. And she mentioned, uh, you live your life every day, but you do something small every day to contribute to it. So uh, as academics, what, it, it, to that gentleman's uh, question, as academics, what can we do every day to assist you? Thank you. We're running over time, so is it okay if we take these questions? Yeah, go, go for it, yes. And I apologize, maybe after, when we finish the, pan, uh, the discussion, we will have a chance to continue in the, at the reception. But, Yes, thank you. Arturas. Uh, yeah, I also pick up few uh, on 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 China, North Korea, other other you no know, uh, dangerous uh, regions and countries and dictators. Uh, so, yeah, this what. Ukraine is fighting now and and the West is not only the battle for Ukraine but the battle for the future of the world in in sense that other dictators are watching that as well very very precisely and very closely and if we will surrender we'll step back we'll uh, you know ask Ukraine to surrender because we want to live our nice and beautiful lives then uh, we'll uh, you know those those problems will come back but in on much bigger scale from from other dictators as well so so it's related so it depends on how we'll be able to stand up to to those challenge uh, today uh it it will determine our future for for many years uh the uh, uh okay on on africa uh there are many many things uh why why africa should 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 be supportive to to Ukraine, but one 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 specific one. Uh, I'm not uh, all of you aware, uh, but the the uh, mercenaries, uh, Russian mercenaries in 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 Ukraine who are fighting Wagner Group and others, uh, they are also uh, you know uh, they they are hired by many African dictators to support their regimes, and if. Uh, you know, Russia fails, probably you will be able, you know, also to to regain your freedom and uh, democracy in your countries. And the last thing on on the question and uh, and uh, intention of gentlemen to visit Ukraine after the war, just uh, I invite you to drop into Lithuania on the way to Ukraine. It's also a nice country. Thank you. Ambassador. Yes, uh, I see our brothers are still in the traffic to Ukraine already. <laughs> we'll, uh, share. we'll share, of course. Oh, well, first, of course, everyone is welcome. And even now, we have people visiting Ukraine. And if you, any of you would like to do that, please contact the embassy. We already know how to do it. Samantha Power is in Kiev today uh, having a wonderful visit. And we, even though we know it's not safe, you know, even in the Western Ukraine now, but if you are willing to go, there is a lot of work there. Um, with regard to what you can do, uh, 
you still can write a lot to the senators and, and congressmen and congresswomen, and please do that, because we need to stay the course. It's getting off the news sometimes, but it's not getting off Ukraine. The war is still there. So everything that you do, whether you are helping some educational institutions or medical institutions, whether you are helping us to treat people here and to the question about, uh, you know, uh, we, we have the program at Ukraine House, which we started, which we are helping um, children that lost their limbs and they're going to, so they're getting their prosthetics here in the United States. We have a lot of soldiers who are getting the prosthetics here. We're trying also to build programs in Ukraine so that we can not only help individuals, but also build this uh, in Ukraine. We all definitely will need psychological, different type of uh, mental health support. Not only those who went through horrible crimes began, but all of us. It's, it's a horrible experience that will so, the, everything that you can do, even if it's a one-person protest in front of the Russian embassy, everything counts, and we are really grateful for all the support. And with regard to, again, just to finish on, on uh, Africa, uh, I think first, I mean, it's, it's, of course, it's a shame. It's a shame that so many conflicts and wars did not get a proper attention during so many years before. And uh, when we discuss it back home now, I think we are also becoming already more active. So for example, now when, when Russia stopped and blocked our grain and other agricultural produce from being produced, after we reached the grain deal and we started exporting it, we also decided to donate some grain and we donated grain for free to Somalia and to Ethiopia and we will continue doing that. You know, and we can produce more, and we can we can we can resolve a lot of conflicts, but uh, a lot of, a lot of problems with food. But also, I think for anyone who who believes in the borders, I mean, we can all have disputes, but you we cannot resolve these disputes through force and war. So I think regardless of of where you are, whether it's Africa or Asia or or Europe or Americas, <coughs> everyone who believes in territorial integrity and sovereignty should support this fight, not for the sake of Ukraine, but for the sake of the international law that has been breached and should be restored. <coughs> and uh, the last point on... New world order. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, and I forgot what was the last New point. World order. New world order, integrity in foreign policy that appears well, through the fight. We try that, but you know, it's I cannot take credit and say that we are, you know, ideal or so much different. I think the situation is so black and white right now. Uh, and again, this is what differentiates this war from other civil conflicts or even some some disputes between the countries. We have a very blatant aggressive act of a nuclear power and a member of the permanent uh, of the Security Council of the United Nations against a peaceful neighbor who never threatened Russia. I mean, look at the map, look at our sizes, look at everything we've done. We have been neutral. We actually is one of the only country in Europe that denuclearized ourselves because in until 1994, Ukraine owed, owned the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And we gave it up because we knew we would never attack anyone. I mean, a lot of people think it wasn't a smart move now. And we believed in the, what we thought were guarantees, which turned out to be assurances, and they turned out not to be even working uh, from, from other, other countries. But, you know, it's just a David against Goliath fight. Oh, there is. And, and, and it's, it's just wrong. So the way we approach it also is like this. We just call it the way it is. We're trying to be as open and transparent. We're trying to open everything because truth is on our side. So it's in our interest also to, 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 to have this integrity and to have the truth and to be open and truthful about it because that helps us. That helps us to show what this fight is about and that ultimately will help us to win. Thank you. Uh, this is great. So with this cheerful note, we would like to thank you so much for your presence, for your insights, for your country's fight. And thank you so much for our speakers and for giving us a really good